So yes, yeah, so today my talk is on psychedelics, PTSD, and racial trauma. Um, let me get everything set up here. Uh, so I don't really need to say much about myself after that wonderful um, introduction. But uh, but I will say that I do a lot of a lot of my research is again on communities of color, in particular um, Black communities. So I may use a lot of African American examples, and um, so I apologize in advance if your special stigmatized group is not mentioned. I try to be inclusive, but only so much I can do in ninety minutes. So yeah. All right. Uh, so. I've been involved in psychedelic research, um, gosh, probably almost seven, maybe eight years now, and um, and I feel like I feel like it's it's a new and emerging field. So a lot of us. Uh, so I mean, there've been some people who've been in it forever, and I will show you some uh, some of those folks, and then others who kind of come in more recently. And there's still so much to do. Um, this is my son, William. He was my my first patient. Don't worry, I did not did not give him any psychedelics. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, and then there's um, some of the folks that I had the opportunity to work with initially uh, at Maps, uh, Amy Emerson, and um, and the Mithoffers. And I think that's Paul Stamets in the background there. And and then there we are again last year in Amsterdam for a conference there. Um, there's a, a Bia Labache of Jacruna. We went on a fantastic trip to Napa Valley and went wine tasting. And, um, and some of my, some of my fantastic, uh, colleagues of color that I've had the opportunity to, um, to present with and write with. And, um, and then, oh yeah, Rick, Rick Doblin, of course, we can't forget him, um, and uh, this is actually a, a conference that I did just this past weekend um, in Boston. It was our, on contrasting visions. It was sponsored by Harvard University. So you can see psychedelics are getting a lot of attention uh, from everywhere. And, and that's um, exciting. And, um, and that uh, gives us so much work to do as researchers. All right. Uh, so, before we talk about racial trauma, I first want to say a few words about racism because I'm going to be talking about racial trauma, which is basically PTSD caused by racism. Um, and so most people feel like they kind of have an idea of what racism is. And I like to describe it briefly because there are many kinds of racism. And most of us are familiar with what we might call old fashioned racism or you know, just like dominative racism, which is like, you know, I hate you because you're a person of color and, and it's that simple. Um, but most people realize that that is, is really not socially acceptable today. So, um, so a lot of this has gone under underground, meaning that a lot of people have racist attitudes. They just don't talk about them in public, but they may still feel racist and they may still do racist things, but they, they may not admit that they do racist things because of racism. Um, and so, uh, and so, one type of racism we might call symbolic or modern racism, and this is the kind of racism where people may find reasons not to like others who are different, just because uh, they they might say, oh well, there's something wrong with that group's culture, or um, people in that group, you know, they do bad things. Uh, sometimes we we call this right wing racism. Um, another type of racism is aversive racism, and these are people who tend to espouse egalitarian views out loud, but um, they may have unconscious biases or um, they may have conscious biases they don't really want to talk about. And, and even though they may say very anti-racist things, they still may act like racists in ambiguous situations. Uh, we call this left-wing racism, just you know, to not leave anybody out. There's racism on both sides of the aisles. Um, Racism uh, can also result in discrimination, major discrimination, which may be things like somebody loses their home or their job because of racism, or the more subtle, common, everyday racial discrimination. Microaggressions are one example of everyday racism, which can include things like patronizing statements or backhanded compliments 
or even things in the environment. Uh, sometimes people of color ingest all of the negative messages that we hear about our group, and then that would be called internalized racism, which can result in negative feelings about the self. And then um, structural racism is, um, is present in all of our laws, policies, and procedures, um, and works to advantage white people at the expense of people of color. And this kind of racism oper can operate without anybody doing anything necessarily racist because it's sort of built into the system. You, you see, I don't have systemic racism listed here because uh, racism is by definition systemic. Um, now, there tend to be different perspectives on racism because people of color and white people tend to have very different experiences. Uh, white people in our society tend to believe that racialized groups are doing well in life, um, that racism is no longer a major issue, and, and also that maybe they are not capable of racist behaviors. Now, people of color, on the other hand, um, are confronted with regular acts of racism, often from the very folks who say they're not capable of racism, so they have a very different reality. Um, white people tend to limit their definition of racism to overt, intentional, blatant acts. Again, as I pointed out, people really don't do that as much anymore. So, um, you know, so if we went by that definition, then, you know, we would never be able to identify racism because nobody admits to wanting to harm people just by virtue of their race, even people that we would all acknowledge are racists, like I don't know, David Duke, who's grand dragon of the KKK, he says, he doesn't have anything against black people. He just wants to support his white culture. So, yeah. Uh, and in fact, racism, because we all live in a racist society, we learn racist behaviors, we all, we all perpetuate racism. So even good people can enact racism. Um, so again, overt feelings of hate and prejudice are not needed to perpetrate racism. Um, and also acts of racism are often overlooked by uh, people who don't experience it. So racism is real and systemic. Here is an example from, from my country, the United States, where I've got, um, I'm comparing black Americans to white Americans. And you can see that um, by just about every economic and social and educational indicator, um, you know, black people are doing worse than white people. And so that's an example of what, of the result of racism. Um, and racism, again, can lead to racial trauma. And traumatization due to racism happens at many levels. So certainly people may experience an individual trauma based on an individual who acts against them in a racist way. That can be traumatic. Um, but usually it's a combination of factors. People may experience um, community trauma, especially if maybe their community, for example, is uh, over-policed or under-policed due to race, then there's gonna be problems and crime and so forth. Um, so people may bear witness to things like gang violence, murders, and so forth, which is traumatic. Um, also, traumatic things can happen in the community, traumatizes the whole community. And then we have cultural trauma. And um, these are the types of, these are traumas that may happen to a whole cultural group. Um, and that can be passed on. And then historical trauma as well, which is also trauma that happens to a whole cultural group, but maybe it's further back in time and it continues to be moved forward. And so it's important to understand that trauma, not only does it happen at many levels, it's also heritable. Uh, so people can um, inherit trauma from their, through social transmission, from their um, parents or family members who may recount things that happened in the past or may behave in a way that transmits fear around things that have happened in the past or um, and or biological inheritance uh, via what we now understand as epigenetics, where you can actually inherit um, a predisposition to have trauma symptoms if your parents or even grandparents have experienced traumatic events. Okay, 
So here are some examples of cultural trauma. Cultural trauma is real. Um, here's um, an example of Af African-American uh, traumatic cultural history where um, black people were kidnapped from Africa, sold into slavery, uh, had to endure things like socially sanctioned rape, Jim Crow laws, segregation, marginalization, and discrimination in the current times. Um, here is another example, uh, the indigenous or Native American experience. This is a picture from a boarding school uh, where children suffered high rates of physical and sexual violence that then led to problems later with addiction, suicide, mental illness, et cetera. And this happened on a very wide scale here in Canada. Uh, here is another example. Um, these are um, these are Japanese World War II um, internment camp uh, survivors. So these were Japanese people that were put in camps during World War II because it was just assumed that maybe they would be traitors because there was a war with Japan too, in addition to Germany. Notably, Germans were not put in internment camps, only Japanese. Uh, so this resulted in negative consequences for the identity of those imprisoned and, um, and their offspring as well. Um, here's another example from um, the Holocaust. And in fact, research has shown that Holocaust survivors, um, the children and grandchildren of the Holocaust survivors are more susceptible to PTSD and they've identified um, biological or inherited mechanisms that um, contribute to that, that issue, as I mentioned, through epigenetics. And then also there's cultural traumas that are like happening today. They're going on all the time, sadly. Um, this is a picture of um, Mexican and other uh, Latin refugees in the United States that are being traumatized and persecuted coming across the US border. You might have heard of kids in cages where they may be separated from their families and then they may have difficulty reuniting them with their families at all. Um, this is the um, example of what's going on, uh, what's been going on in, in Ukraine, where you see actually these are um, Ukrainians. This is footage of them sort of being marched off to execution. Um, and um, there's other traumas happening all the time. And uh, and then we have some traumas happening right now. Um, right now, there's trauma happening in Israel. I mentioned the Jewish history of the Holocaust, and then there was the traumatic Hamas attack on October 7th. Same is true also of Palestinians in the Israeli occupied territories, um, where they have a traumatic history of being expelled from their homeland, having living under apartheid for decades, Children suffer from malnutrition, lack of medical care and illiteracy, and are subject to ongoing harms and harassment. And now there's, you know, with the current hostilities, over 30,000 dead um, in what the UN has called the world's largest open air prison. Um, and so you better believe that that's a traumatized population. All right, so trigger warning for the next examples. I'm going to talk a little bit about the trauma of Black America. And these are difficult pictures to look at. These are actually um, Black people who were lynched and burned. And they weren't the only ones lynched and burned, by the way, just to be as inclusive as possible. Many Mexicans were also lynched and burned. Um, but, uh, uh, and actually people used to make postcards out of these. How sick is that? Um, and unfortunately, these tools of terror are being used even now to um, terrorize Black people because of the history of these objects and symbols and behaviors. They're particularly effective at causing trauma in Black people today. So, um, so special historical weapons of terror include the noose, um, include even white women pretending to be harmed and calling the police on Black people and use of the n-word um so these are actually these are all trauma triggers and reminders 
here's another example of community trauma. Brianna Taylor was an emergency medical tech in Louisville, Kentucky, and part of the healing community there. I actually lived in Louisville myself for five years. So it feels like part of my community too. When this happened, the 26 year old black woman's friends and family say she was much loved and relished the opportunity to brighten someone's day. Uh, Louisville police officers forced their way into her apartment in the early morning hours of March 13th, 2020. Uh, Brianna Taylor was not the target of the raid, and the suspect that the police were searching for was not even at her home. Nonetheless, they gunned her down in her home while she slept, and now her name's become a rallying cry at protest calling for police reforms. And many point to her story as an example of police violence that um, resulted in community trauma. Um, and here's another example. Uh, you, this is a massacre that happened in Buffalo, Buffalo, New York, where um, you can see that that this is just one event in a long, ongoing string of racially motivated murders of Black Americans. Black Americans. And what I want to point out about this is that um, the gunman drove three hours from his home to find the most segregated community that he could to ensure the highest body count possible of Black people. Um, the fact that these communities were segregated is not an accident. They were intentionally segregated um, by people who didn't want um, Blacks in their neighborhood. Um, so, so yes, 10 people were murdered and, um, and this young man care, uh, declared his support for white supremacy. And, and in his manifesto, um, he did share why he picked, he picked that area. Uh, and um, this doesn't just happen in the States. It happens plenty <laughs> here in Canada as well. Um, here's another example of hate that resulted in community trauma. Indigenous woman Joyce Echequan was racially abused as she lay dying in a Quebec hospital in September of 2020. She came into the hospital with pains and the medical staff immediately assumed wrongly that she was suffering from drug addiction. Um, they assumed she was an opium addict, even though she was actually suffering from a heart condition. And this is how stereotypes kill people, by the way. She was restrained. They gave her morphine, which she was allergic to, and put her with a nurse in training to watch her when she didn't improve. The nurses taunted her and accused her of faking symptoms and being a sex worker and she live streamed this abuse on Facebook before she died. The coroner concluded that Ms. Echequan's initial diagnosis was based on prejudice and that she was not properly treated or monitored. Um, a Quebec Superior Court justice released a report and concluded that it's impossible to deny that they face systemic racism in Quebec. Several people from her community testified in an inquiry about experiencing dismissive treatment, racist slurs, intolerance for their language and lack of interpreters at the Joylet Hospital where she died. Um, a statement released by the Grand Council of Crees read, the hospital staff did not see her as a human being, but as something that they could abuse with impunity. It's important to understand that this was not simply an individual act of racism. It's easy to say the nurse or the doctor was a bad apple. But the fact of the matter is it was known that indigenous people were being treated poorly at that hospital and it's systematic, it's systemic racism that allowed this problem to continue unchecked and that produced um, and tolerated medical staff like the ones who killed Ms. Echequan. And so this racist act was a tragedy that then became a community trauma. So here are some examples of individual traumatizing acts of racism that people might experience. And I put this list here because these are things, because certainly most of us have heard of things like um, rape or combat resulting in PTSD. And these are the types of events that can be caused by racism that um, can lead to diagnosis of PTSD. Um, and I won't read all of these for you, but, um, but Many of these are quite common. The ones at the bottom um, may be more common among immigrants and refugees. So 
Um, so we know that there are profound connections between racism and mental health. And we have research for the past 20 years that shows some pretty definitive links to just about every major mental illness and experiences of racism and discrimination. These are just a few, there are many more. Um, and this is how uh, racial trauma happens. So, and then on top of that, when people of color experience racial trauma, they may not uh, be able to find help. They may be dealing with experiences like being bullied at school or um, ongoing microaggressions or even being stopped by the police in a person's own neighborhood for jogging more than once or disrespect in the workplace. And so, so my question in response to all this, so I studied racism for a long time. And one of the things that I was interested in is can psychedelics heal racial trauma? That's, um, and that's been the focus of a lot of the work that I've been doing over, over the last few years. Now, psychedelics, for those of you who don't know, are a class of psychoactive substances that produce what we call non-ordinary states of consciousness through changes in perception, mood, and cognitive processes. And these um, listed here in the middle, these are a few of the psychedelics that are being studied um, in research for, for their mental health properties. You may, you may recognize some of them. And some of and there's many different ways to, these are classified. Some of these are considered classic hallucinogens or enactogens or dissociative hallucinogens. And I'm just gonna call them all psychedelics for the purpose of this talk because, um, because they're all being used in a similar way. And they all produce these non-ordinary states of consciousness. And as you can see, there's been a lot of media attention um, around, around the potential of these substances to, um, to improve mental health and well-being. Um, now, some a lot of the work, particularly around MDMA, has been done through MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Um, they have a nonprofit piece and a and a public benefit corporation. It's recently changed its name to Lycos. Um, but anyway, these are uh, these are the results of their phase three trials in terms of. Um, determining if MDMA can help people with PTSD. As you can see, uh, it did twice as well as um, placebo. And many people with who got the treatment lost their PTSD diagnosis. It is important, though, to underscore that it's not just a magic pill, but it is MDMA plus therapy. In the study, people get three um, MDMA sessions that you, know, you get therapy before, MDMA therapy after, and um, and that is thought to help make that all work together. Um, it's uh, Lycos is now applying to the FDA for permission to market MDMA as a legal drug in the states, and people are hopeful that it will be approved before the end of the year. So, uh, knock on wood, we've yet to see if that will happen. Um, Psychedelic medicine, however, is not a new thing. Actually, many people vaguely remember that LSD and other psychedelic drugs were once used experimentally in psychiatry, um, but few people realize how much and how long they were used. This was not a quickly rejected and forgotten fad. Uh, between 1950 and the mid 1960s, there were more than a thousand clinical papers that discussed a to over 40,000 patients several dozen books, six international conferences on psychedelics, and so forth. And so, and a lot of that research happened right here in Canada. Um, further, I think it's important to mention that indigenous cultures all over the world have traditionally been using plant medicines uh, for illness and to enhance health in their communities. Uh, for example, psilocybin mushrooms were even used by Aztec shaman in healing in a variety of religious and divinatory rituals, these mushrooms um, were known as God's flesh in Aztec language. I'm not gonna try to pronounce the word, um, but, um, and psychedelics have been used by the Native American church as well. Um, 
as peyote. So, so you might be wondering, uh, well, I know I've been wondering, can psychedelics heal racial trauma? So our lab um, started doing a number of studies, including naturalistic studies, survey studies, um, and we were even involved with the, the MAPS trials for a while. And, and so the science definitely seems to indicate that psychedelics can be beneficial for racial trauma under the right circumstances. I'll share a little more about a few of these. Um, so, so emerging research, yes, um, shows that psychedelics can be helpful. However, randomized controlled trials are still needed with all the hype coming in advance of the science. You can imagine my chagrin when I saw my research slightly misrepresented <laughs> in the media. Um, yeah, so, uh, so yes, yeah, so we need, um, so we still, we do not have clinical trials showing that um, psychedelics can, can heal racial trauma. We do um, have some case studies and some naturalistic studies and clinical trials are the next step. Um, and we're definitely not saying like, go run out to the club and take MDMA for your racial trauma. So, um, but anyway, as I pointed out, you know, the media, they always like a, a fun story. I'll tell you a little bit about one of the actual studies we did. Um, and this was a survey study that where we collected data in Canada and the US from um, people who said, people of color who said that they had used psychedelics um, to deal with uh, the stress of racism. We, recru we recruited over 400 participants. Um, this particular study, we, we didn't use everybody for this. Um, we were only looking at, in, in this analysis, only people who used psilocybin, LSD, and MDMA. And, um, and that was 313. And they were asked about their past experiences um, and their mental health symptoms. And what we found was that, first of all, people of color are very clearly using psychedelics to cope with the racism, with the trauma of racism. And for the most part, most people um, had um, described positive results that seemed to be um, potentiated by uh, the intensity of the psychedelic effects. So the stronger the effects, the more changes in mental health symptoms people reported. And that included more mystical experiences, more insightful experiences, fewer challenging or difficult experiences. And um, which led to decreases in racial trauma symptoms, feelings of stress, depression, and anxiety. And so and these were also, also feeling like a person was in a safe setting seemed to me uh, to make a big difference in how effective the, the um, psychedelic was. Uh, for example, indigenous people living on tribal lands showed more improvement than those living elsewhere. Um, there were all, also, this was significantly related to increases in psychological flexibility, which were in turn related to a change in trauma symptoms. And these patterns of results were similar regardless of the psychedelic used. So, um, uh, so this again was all promising. Um, however, you know, there's still a lot, still we need to do some clinical trials um, to see if this will help if a person has a history of PTSD from racism. All right. Now, um, no, so there are also many important needs in the field, one of which is that if we're going to actually do work with people of color, we have to actually have therapists of color who, who can go into those communities and do that work. And also, um, just all therapists need to have really good skills um, around doing culturally informed therapies. And so one of the things I was really excited to do was organize a conference and training um, for therapists of color in conjunction with MAPS. We got some grant funding from the Open Societies Foundation and we, um, and we did a, a 
a one day conference and then like a it's like four or five day training. And we also got more funds. We got um, in addition to um, OSF, we got some funds from other organizations as well, including um, River Sticks, Libra Foundation, Dr. Parker Soaps, Psychedelic Science Funders Collaborative. Um, and we had trained the largest cohort ever of therapists of color, which was 50 at one time. Um, and one of the reasons we wanted to have it in Kentucky is because we wanted to be able to reach um, the communities of color who were there in Kentucky, because it just seemed like a lot of these trainings were going on on the East Coast or the West Coast, and people sort of forgot about the middle of the country. So um, we thought we'd do it there. It was a large Black community. I had a lot of contacts in that community, so did um, other people on our training team. But when we actually ran the the conference, um, we got no no local local people of color at all. And this was very concerning and confusing to us because we did a lot of community outreach and we're really good at community outreach, but like know how to do that. And the fact that, I mean, that we didn't have any local people was a little disappointing. And so, uh, so I did a little research into this question and we uncovered some really interesting things. And so this brings me to the next section of my talk called Can Psychedelics Harm People of Color, um, Abuse and Weaponized Medicine. And, and this is where it gets weird, okay? Um, I know no, there's no good story that doesn't include Nazis, right? Uh, so yeah, sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction. After World War II, um, the CIA recruited 1,600 German physicians and scientists to develop technologies for use against the Soviets in the Cold War. And this was called Operation Paperclip. Now, again, these were not necessarily good people. Um, there were 15 dedicated Nazis where six had stood trial at Nuremberg um, for human rights violations. And their expertise arose from the manufacture of chemical weapons for the Third Reich, including the toxic nerve agent Sarin. One of the German chemists, uh, Richard Kuhn, uh, brought LSD to the attention of the CIA in 1948. And soon they started testing it as a tool for enhanced interrogation against Soviet spies who had been captured by uh, Nazis. Um, now, um, now, in America's Cold War, which took place uh, from March 1947 to December 1991, uh, there was really some concern that the Soviets were going to somehow uh, win the Cold War and that they had developed ways of controlling people's minds. And so uh, they thought, of course, because there were people who were defecting to the Soviet Union, and there was like, well, why would anyone defect unless someone was controlling their mind? So clearly they had to have some sort of mind control drug. And so Project MK Ultra was born of this paranoia that they had actually achieved this. And so this was um, the CIA's covert counter operation to locate the ultimate truth serum for interrogations. Um, and, so, and so there was a lot of research going on at different sites across the US and Canada and even Europe where people were receiving grant funds to, to do these experiments, they didn't necessarily know it was from the CIA. Um, and, and one example, um, at, well, much of this early psychedelic research that happened during this period from 1950 to 1980 was uh, unethical, exploitative, and abusive. Um, for example, hundreds of people were given LSD along with amphetamines, opiates, and other psychedelics in extremely high doses and dosing schedules that would be considered unsafe today, often without their knowledge or consent. Most of these abuses um, were of incarcerated black men that happened at the Addiction Research Center um, in Lexington, Kentucky, in what was often affectionately called the narco farm. Um, and so because of that legacy of events, uh, this had resulted in sort of some community trauma whereby um, the 
people of color in Lexington didn't want anything to do with psychedelic drugs. Um, and the um, narco farm closed down when um, after the Tuskegee um, in, after the Tuskegee Institute uh, syphilis study came public, and then it was made illegal to use uh, prisoners for this kind of research. So they closed down, moved to Bethesda, and became NIDA. Um, and so, anyway, by 1960, at the um, there was a lot of understanding behind the scenes that the MK Ultra experiments weren't working anyway. Um, head chemist Cindy uh, Sydney Gottlieb said that uh, no effective knockout pill, truth serum, aphrodisiac, or recruitment pill was known to exist. Although they kept doing the experiments for nearly um, for some time later, although it was later confirmed that um, any data gathered from these experiments was useless. Um, now, the Senate Watergate investigation will lead to the end of both MKUltra and pre the presidency of Richard Nixon, but not before he was able to launch the war on drugs in 1971 um, and the Controlled Substances Act. And this was um, a Nixon legacy that made psychedelics Schedule One drugs in the U.S., here in Canada, they're called Schedule Three, and they're categorized as having no currently accepted medical use. And so this designation effectively shut down research into LSD and other psychedelics until the late 1990s when public interest in these substances was renewed. Um, however, the war on drugs uh, turned out to really be a war on people of color. Um, so the original drug laws were intended to target people of color, and in many ways, they still do. Um, many currently illegal drugs, such as opiates and psychedelics, have actually been used for thousands of years for both medical and spiritual purposes. But why some drugs are legal and other drugs are illegal is not based on science surrounding the risks of those substances, but rather who's associated with those drugs so political reasons and bias. And so again, nothing to do with the actual social and physical harms of the drugs that are illegal, but more to do with moralism and historical racism toward black people, Chinese people and indigenous groups. And this is evident in criminal justice disparities and the way that some drugs, which are objectively less harmful than other drugs, for example, MDMA is highly criminalized across the world um, whereas drugs that have been proven to be more harmful, such as alcohol and benzodiazepines, are not highly criminalized for the most part. And the development of punitive drug policies has been largely fueled, again, by fears of racial integration, indigenous sovereignty, and of Black and Asian men having sexual relations with white women. And so after the war on drugs was um, you know, renewed, by Ronald Reagan in the United States in the 1980s, Canadian Prime Minister Brian Mulroney was quick to follow suit. And so these policies, which um, you know, happened in the United States, end up affecting the whole world. And so because of the resurgence in interest in psychedelics today, um, many people are calling this the psychedelic renaissance. Again, this recent surge of scientific and cultural interest in the medical, mental health, and spiritual benefits of psychedelics. Nonetheless, there are many issues that need to be figured out around this. Um, for example, um, our team did um, a deep dive into who's been included and who's not been included in psychedelic research trials. We looked at randomized controlled trials that happened um, you know, over a you know over a, a large period of time in in this second wave, what we call the second wave of psychedelic research, and we found that um, eighty two percent of the participants were white, only two point five percent were black, which led to this article in Tonic: Black Americans are being left out of psychedelic research. Of course, they're not the only ones being left out. 
Also in 2022, we reviewed uh, ketamine RCTs for mood disorders, and um, 31 studies were identified, but 21 didn't even have disclosed race or ethnicity data at all. And 10 studies provided sufficient analysis, uh, data for analysis, and of those eight studies, there were no black people or Asian people at all. Um, so, so we need to we need to include more people of color so that the findings are generalizable. Um, also, psychedelics can hurt in other ways too, and um, and we call this sometimes weaponization of medicine. In 1928, um, the American, uh, in the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA reported that in Hawaii, an ethnic Japanese handyman and chauffeur known as Kisan had been arrested as the chief suspect in the kidnapping and murder of a young white boy, a member of the family for whom the suspect worked. A ransom letter was received and the family delivered the cash um, to a specified delivery point, but the child was found murdered thereafter. And while in police custody, Kesan maintained his innocence, but a police surgeon injected him with a substantial dose of hyosamine, hyosamine, I think that's how you say it, you can correct me. This is a relaxant chemically similar to um, the more popular sedative uh, scop uh, scopolamine, and in small doses, um, these are used even today to prevent motion sickness. However, the heavy injection administered to Kassan induced a twilight sleep state in which he became docile and talkative. And he reportedly confessed to both to writing the ransom letter and to the murder itself. And so, um, but when the drug wore off, he um, repudiated his confession and steadily asserted his innocence. And although he was given another injection and questioned again, Questioned again, no further confession was forthcoming. And interestingly, after a different man was found to have done the murder. Um, now, this case was not exceptional. These substances in combination with morphine alone or alone became increasingly common in the US around the turn of the century by doctors and law enforcement agents who saw these drugs as a mean to induce twilight sleep um, and um, you know, get confessions from, from criminals or suspected criminals. And, um, and even today, we see um, psychedelics being weaponized as met, wep being weaponized medicine used against people of color. And here I have the example of um, Elijah McLean, who um, was administered ketamine while handcuffed. Uh, medical experts worry about its use during police calls because ketamine, which is a powerful sedative, um, can calm people and, and police um, are starting to use this as, as a chemical restraint. Um, and there have been several inst instances where uh, people have had adverse outcomes or even died because um, they were given ketamine. For example, over a four-day period in Aurora, Colorado, 22-year-old Elijah McLean and 25-year-old Elijah McKnight were both given doses of ketamine in separate police incidents, incidents and McLean went into cardiac arrest and died several days later. Um, McKnight was hospitalized on life support but survived, and video footage of both incidents shows that neither man was resisting arrest when the ketamine uh, was administered. And so the police use um, an excuse or a diagnosis called excited delirium uh, to justify having the paramedics administer ketamine. And this is defined as bizarre or aggressive behavior, shouting, paranoia, panic, violence towards others, unexpected physical strength, and hyperthermia. Um, <clears throat> So, so there's a lot of problems with this. For one, police are not trained to diagnose anything, much less excited delirium. That would be a medical professional's job. And also there's not even any such thing as excited delirium. It's not a diagnosis. 
that's recognized by you know any major medical organization. Um, and so and so it's really like just a, a phrase they came up with. And you know, and McLean only weighed 143 pounds when he was arrested, but he was given a ketamine dose for um, a 200 pound man. And so, um, yeah, and so uh, the American Society of Anesthesiologists has come out against the use of ketamine for non-medical purposes, but unfortunately it's still widely used in this way. Um, for example, as of December 21st, um, over the previous two and a half years, Colorado medics had injected over 900 people for excited delirium leading to serious complications in 17% of cases. Um, and it was found that it was used most often on black people, surprise. Um, and Greenville, South Carolina had administered the drug 200 times. Um, and as of today, it's um, legal in 48 states in the US. Interestingly, not Colorado anymore, um, nor Hawaii. So, but negative experiences can even occur within a therapeutic setting. And so this is um, a paper I wrote called Three Black Women Therapists Describe Their MDMA Experiences. Um, this emerged out of the training experiences with MDMA uh, that um, was done with my team when I was at the University of Connecticut and we were part of the MAPS trials. Uh, it was a way for people to for a therapist to get trained so that they would know what the patients would experience. Um, and this was the first paper focused on the psychedelic experiences of, of Black women that we know of. Interestingly, in all three cases, cultural themes emerged, um, but the, the clinicians who were, the, um, who were facilitating the experience, um, many of them did not have a training or experience to skillfully deal with cultural materials. And so, in fact, one of the three women had a bad experience due to prior racial trauma. And because the therapist didn't know how to properly work with the material, she um, became suicidal. So, so this is again why uh, training is so important. Um, so there are many factors that impact individual responses to psychedelic therapies, including race, ethnicity, ethnicity, and culture. Um, so again, when I said psychedelics can heal racial trauma, it, it has to be under the right circumstances. And so, um, for example, in this figure, we see what we, um, what often people talk about as an important ingredient in psychedelic assisted therapy, set and setting, set referring to the mindset, and the setting, the environment the person's in. And there's also another factor called biology as well that um, plays a role. Now, and culture can impact all of these things. So for example, in terms of what makes a good setting, you know, we often talk about things like the decor of the room and the lights and the music. Um, the artwork and the design, but part of this is going to also be things like culturally sensitive clinicians and even art is cultural, music is cultural. The choices of what kind of art and music you're going to use are all cultural considerations. The set, this includes a person's beliefs, expectations, personality, intentions, preparations, right? And there's a cultural piece to this as well. And this can include things like social status, um, discrimination, spiritual beliefs, right? These all also make up the person's mindset. And then we have biology. And I just want to clarify, we're not looking at race as a biological construct. However, we do know that there are cultural variations in how people respond to medicines, such as diet variations or enzyme expression differences. So, so these are all um, things that have to be considered if we're going to do this, this work safely. Um, with people from all sorts of racial, ethnic, and cultural backgrounds. And so I like to imagine what would, what if we lived in a world where psychedelic healing was there for everyone? Um, what would this look like for 
traumatized communities of color. Well, in order for that to happen, we need to and be able to engage these communities. And people of color may struggle with trusting the process for so many of the reasons we've already discussed. Um, psychedelic assisted therapy clients are in a position of increased vulnerability. Um, so, you know, if you um, go and see a therapist and they say something you don't like, you can get up and leave. But once you've taken a psychedelic, you can't go, you're stuck there. Um, racial issues may emerge that make therapists uncomfortable or even aggressive. And again, you don't want that happening to you when you're in a vulnerable state. Psychedelics can strip a person of their normal psychological protections, um, which is good if you are working with trauma and a person needs to maybe bring down some of these mental walls in order to address the trauma. But by the same token, they're gonna be more vulnerable to being harmed in that condition. And also clients, again, they may endure disorientation and immobilization until the effects wear off. And so again, as I mentioned, can't just get up and go. Uh, so, so people uh, of color who may feel like they always have to be on guard everywhere may not feel safe um, getting psychedelics, particularly if it's with clinicians they don't they don't know and trust. And so, um, here's an example of somebody having maybe a psychedelic experience where they might say something like this during their experience: "I feel a heavy weight on me." It's the way of centuries of hate and oppression. There are white people's hands coming at me from all directions, grabbing and pulling me, right? And so being able to work with material like this that emerges requires a special kind of trusting relationship and a special kind of competence. Hmm. So what, um, what does this all mean? Psychedelics are not new. Uh, but integrating them into our current Western medical paradigms is new. Um, psychedelics can be beneficial for mental health and well being, and public wants them. Uh, but there are many concerns, and it's not a panacea. Um, and the research is very promising, but more is needed to unravel the mysteries of psychedelics. Um, I guess last week I had the opportunity to testify before the House of Commons and their Standing Committee on Science and Research. So the topic was integration of indigenous traditional knowledge and science and government policy development. And um, But I was surprised that there were actually a lot of questions about psychedelics. Um, so um, I, I pointed out that much of what we know today about how to conduct psychedelic assisted therapy was actually appropriated from indigenous people all over the world, including the Native American church in Canada. Um, although most psychedelic plant medicines are not legal in Canada, indigenous people across North America use these substances in ceremonial, medicinal, and underground settings to help deal with the stress and trauma of racism. <clears throat> um, further, psychedelics have a great potential to address the need for novel PTSD treatments particularly for our nation's veterans. And so we need to invest more into studying them, and making them more available to the public. Now, can psychedelics bring us together? This is a question I hear often, um, sometimes more of a statement than a question. Um, and sometimes I think it's meant to imply that, well, why don't we just all take psychedelics together and that will cure us of all of our biases and hate and fear, and then we just all hold hands, walk into the sunset. Um, and that um, hasn't happened. Psychedelic communities is about problems too. So uh, for the most part, people continue to lead segregated lives. They live in segregated neighborhoods, have segregated friendship groups. Um, so in order for psychedelics to bring us together, we need more than medicine. We need intention. <clears throat> so um, you can ask yourself questions like these. How can I be a force for change, right? How can I be a racial justice ally? How can we connect across our differences? This is what we need. And you can't forge real connections without vulnerability. There's no real growth without 
real risk, and we can't connect across differences without courage. Um, I love this quote by Maya Angelou, courage is the most important of all the virtues, because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. So again, we need not just psychedelics, but intention and courage. So how, how, what are some things we can do in the service of our intentions, right? We need to increase the diversity of our own um, circles in our own work. That means connecting with others across racial, ethnic, and cultural differences. Um, understanding our own biases and engaging in work to eliminate these biases, knowing that we never completely eliminate them, but you work toward it. Um, respecting different ways of knowing, um, you know, there's a lot more to understand than Western science. I'm a scientist, I'm a big proponent of science, and there's a lot of things outside of science that are also true. Um, and being a racial justice ally, which means levering our privilege to center others with less privilege. Um, so now I'm going to just share a little bit about what our lab is doing um, to respond to the challenge. I mentioned that there was uh, uh, that horrible research that had happened in Lexington, Kentucky. And one of the, um, you know, the MK ultra abuses have been largely ignored by researchers in the United States government. Um, and to our knowledge, no academic or government body has made contact with affected communities to hear their stories. Um, or to find out their opinions about what should be done or to advocate on their behalf. And so um, we are going to be holding listening circles in Lexington, Kentucky, to hear from community members about how these events that happened, you know, some time ago may still be affecting people today. Um, uh, people who, people or families or descendants of people who may have been impacted by abusive drug studies. Because as I pointed out, um, community traumas can linger um, cultural traumas and historical traumas. And so these listening circles are also going to help us uh, figure out what the barriers are to research and mental health care for communities of color, in particular Black communities, and help inform cultural considerations going forward uh, for psychedelic research and therapy to improve access um, for those groups. Um, also, we are organizing a number of retreats and workshops in um, in South America. And so I had the opportunity to visit uh, John, Dr. Jonathan Flores, his wife, Sophia, in Ecuador um, a few years ago when they invited me to come and learn more about their work with um, traditional plant medicines. And, and I had the opportunity to go down there with my colleague, Dr. Ann Fowley, to learn about what they were doing there. And so, um, and it, it was really fantastic work. In the end, I ended up organizing three retreats in Ecuador, um, which included um, plant medicine ceremonies and um, a self-care workshop for um, therapists, for healers, um, for people of color, for advocates, and we had one for um, black women. And uh, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah. And so these are pictures from our inaugural workshop in July. And I was able to raise some scholarship funding from the Bob Parsons Foundation and anonymous uh, donors. Um, so uh, so these treats, again, were for training to promote connection and healing and sanctuary for people of color to heal in community. And um, we're going to have uh, we're going we're in the process of organizing some more of these in Jamaica for the coming year. Um, we're also uh, we've, we're also studying um, ketamine assisted therapy for depression and looking at uh, epigenetic changes from pre to post treatment. We have um, a my tax proposal out right now that we're waiting to hear back on that will provide funding for this study that and that's happening right here at U Ottawa. And also we need, as these medicines are coming quickly, a diverse, well-trained psychedelic practitioner workforce. And so 
here's what we're doing um, in terms of training programs for practitioners and researchers who want to learn just a little more or become psychedelic therapists or you know, get advanced um, research degrees in psychedelics. We're offering an interdisciplinary training program that includes psychedelic science, history, culture, and healing modalities. And this includes specialized tracks for mental health professionals, clergy, indigenous spiritual healing traditions, and researchers. And so um, part of this is going to be producing diverse clinicians year after year to meet the needs of every community. Um, and so we've got uh, two micro programs that have been running for a while now, one out of arts in psychedelics and spirituality, and each micro program is three graduate courses. And uh, we have a newer one in psychedelic science that's running out of psychology. And um, the Masters of Arts in Psychedelics and Consciousness Studies was recently approved, and we're looking to enroll our first class um, in the fall. And the graduate diploma certificate got a little tied up due to bureaucracy and incompetence, but that is still coming. <laughs> um, all right. And we have training partnerships with Chakruna Institute um, for Psychedelic Plant Medicines. Uh, they are also offering. Um, this course, this nine week course, diversity, culture, and social justice. And so uh, prerequisite for our U Ottawa training programs is some um, multicultural training at the graduate level. And so if people haven't had that or they just wanna learn more, they can take this course. I do teach one of the lectures for this program, um, but other topics you know, include intersectionality, implicit bias, queer aspects, cultural humility, social identity, power and privilege, healing the racial divide, uses of, psych uh, uses of indigenous plant medicines, and challenges around mainstreaming and globalization. So all good stuff. Um, also, we have, um, there's a book coming out that I was fortunate to be part of the team called Deliberate Practice in Psychedelic Assisted Therapy, published by the American Psychological uh, uh, Association. Um, and, you know, and actually the, the lead author, Dr. Shannon Dames, also Canadian. So that means it's definitely gonna be good. Um, and then also this one I wrote before managing microaggressions for um, to help people understand how to, how to not do microaggressions. Um, and I also have a, a great video with PESI on understanding and treating racial trauma without psychedelics. So that's available too. And then for people who wanna continue conversations around these issues, um, I have a meetup group called Anti-Racism International, in USA, Canada, and Europe. And um, this is just for anybody who'd like to have a respectful conversation, an open conversation about issues related to racism um, in the Western world. Uh, so we have different topics. And so you can just go on meetup and join that and you'll get the announcement when the next thing is coming up. And um, yeah, and that's that's uh, my presentation for today. So uh, thank you very much for, for coming and we'll spend the rest of the time with uh, questions and, and conversation, which I'm sure will be interesting and stimulating. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Williams. So I'm gonna open it up. We've got about 10 minutes or so for questions. So I'd invite you to please, um, uh, would anybody like to get the ball rolling? Hi, thank you very much. It was really interesting. Um, I was wondering if you knew a bit about the legal context in Canada. So for those practitioners and healers that are going to train, I understand that MDMA might become legal in the U.S. and or if you're in the in the frame of research, then it can be legal for a practitioner to exercise, but Outside of that, how how do you how do you see things evolve? How is it currently? Yeah, good question. So, um, I mean, the expectation is MDMA is going to become legal in the states first, and Canada hopefully will follow shortly thereafter. Um, Canada, in Canada right now, there's a lot more research um, with psilocybin moving forward faster, and so I think psilocybin is going to be legalized here first. Um, right now, however, you can get these substances through um, 
the um, special access program. So if a person has a condition that a um, doctor feels like you really need this um, psychedelic to address it, they can um, do the work to get the paperwork in and, and get approved for that person to get the substances that way. Although, you know, that's not a necessarily straightforward or easy process. Um, and currently, ketamine-assisted um, therapy is legal and is is going on right now. So that's that's happening and expanding. And I think we're going to see a lot more places around Canada offering offering um, ketamine-assisted therapy. And then, as these psychedelics start to become legalized one by one, those are going to be sort of added to what's offered. So. Um, and I don't know if anyone else has any other updates. Oh, Alberta did legalize psychedelic therapy um, specifically for medical professionals. So I was kind of surprised by that. I'm like, Alberta, really? Okay. <laughs> um, and also many of these substances are already essentially decriminal. The plant medicines are essentially decriminalized in most places, but unfortunately, because they're not legal, I, I can't use them you know, therapeutically and, you know, have a psychologist blessing. So they need to become legalized. And maybe others have some more updates on some of these things. I know stuff's moving fast. And there's a big push also by veterans um, to get the CELSI band legalized. So I think that's going to happen fast because the politicians are afraid of veterans. So. Yeah. For presentation, thank you. I was wondering that if you know about uh, for current practitioners that have patients um, of color, uh, are there any like um, regulations in terms of like the trainings that they are required to follow in order to see patients? Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. So you know, the official answer is that you know all clinicians get uh, training in this. The, the reality is that almost none do. So um, it's a big problem. You know, we we did a, a national survey um, to look at this issue and found that you know um, many many people of color um, were saying they couldn't find people to see from their own ethnic group. They had bad experiences. They couldn't find people that spoke their language. Um, you know, they just didn't. Yeah. They didn't have a good experience. Well, I mean, a lot of a lot of white people didn't have good experiences either. So there just seems to be a lot of problems across the board. But it was definitely worse for people of color. And um, there's there's a push. I know. Well, I'm a psychologist, so I'm involved with the American. I mean, the Canadian Psychological Association. I'm part of their accreditation committee. And one of the things I've been pushing for is to make sure that the programs are admitting students of color and training um, students. In working with students of color, and I gotta tell you, it's a mess. There, it, it's just terrible. So, a lot of work to do there, and and I can't speak to the the other um, the other mental health disciplines, but I, I imagine it's not much better. Yeah. Hi, that was a really really interesting presentation. Thank you. Um, I was curious if you know. Any uh, research has been done on people of color who do anti-racism work, either as, for example, activists or academics, and if like the therapized MDM MDMA has allowed them to continue doing that work where they otherwise felt the trauma was too much for them. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I, nobody has studied that in a research context yet, um, but I can tell you from the plant medicine retreats we did where there were actually like a number of you know, clinicians of color and other helpers, many of them did feel that this helped them kind of get over some humps and hurdles. I mean, I can just even just talk for myself. I did a, I went to an ayahuasca retreat in Costa Rica right after I was completely traumatized at the University of Connecticut when they pretty much shut down my um, MDMA study um, and was like, ah, I can't deal with this anymore. And and while I was there, actually, I, I got inspiration and I felt like I could actually um, write a paper about our culturally informed approaches, even though we only got one person through the study before they shut it down. Um, and we had great publicity, too. But um, but at least like all that work we did, which was years of preparation, didn't go to waste because we were able to use that to inform the field. So, yeah. Happen. 
Yeah. Um, going forward, as the like legalization happening, how do you make sure that these the therapy are accessible and that they're not like over regulated? Um, as people look at legalization framework. Yes. Yeah. It's it's a good question. I mean. I mean, my perspective is if it grows out of the ground, legalize it. And if, you know, you make it in a lab, regulate it, but people need access, right? Um, so, you know, I mean, it, it still remains to be seen how all this is going to roll out. But um, But many of us who do this work are sort of constantly you know, trying to work with, you know, policy, politicians, policymakers, other decision makers to make sure that this, you know, rolls out in a way that's that's going to be beneficial. Of course, you can't really guarantee that, you know, you only do your best. Right. Got time for one last question. So really like your presentation. And I just want to ask you about, like, you said how psychedelics were already like talked about in 1950s. I'd like to know how fascination has evolved from then until today. Right. So, uh, so you pointed out that many of these were avail um, available in the fifties, and then yeah. like how that became rekindled today, or uh, yeah, like how that like that the first like how that oh. we interested in the same thing as today, for example. Right. That's a good question. So, I mean, certainly there was a lot of interest clinically in using these to help people like for in particular there was a lot of use around um you know psychedelics for problems like you know um alcohol addiction but um you know but from the research i have looked at from that previous era a lot of it is unethical or unscientific or both or it's not even clear what they're trying to get out of it i by today's standards would not be considered good research um, for a number of reasons, but, um, but what happened though, was once these substances were made illegal, there were still a number of people who, a number of scientists and researchers who had done work with the substances clinically or in the research who really wanted to bring them back because they felt so strongly they were useful. And so, um, that, and so there were a few people, I guess, that kept the, the flame burning until, you know, they were able to come to the surface and, and try to get these these medicines um, reclassified by by doing more solid research on them. Is it quick? If it's quick, quick. I just I read a really a book I found really interested from Michael Pollan. It's like how mind, anyways, Michael Pollan. I don't know if it's a book that you could you know or you would recommend, but if you're in, it would answer your question that in a lot of details. Yeah, yeah. Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind, actually was really instrumental in um raising awareness and interest in psychedelics. Uh very well written. I read it. It's um that's a great book. It is, it is not exactly, I mean, it's a lot of history in it. It's not very inclusive, I'll say. So don't take that as the last word on the history of the subject. There are others that are not just white men who did stuff, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's a great book. And I think, you know, can answer a lot of questions. So, all right. Thank you very much again, Dr. Williams, for a fascinating discussion. All a great afternoon.